today our guest is the Honorable Judge Ruchi Fryer, the civil court judge for the Kings County Fifth Judicial District in New York State. She's the first Hasidic woman to be elected as a civil court judge in New York State and the first Hasidic woman to hold public office in United States history. Although she ran for the civil court after her election, she was assigned to serve on the criminal court in Kings County Fifth Judicial District. Karen and I have interviewed so many influential, remarkable people on Yentas in the City, but this story uplifted us as women. It's a success story that has captivated our hearts. It's about a woman who broke all boundaries, yet stayed within her own religious and community boundaries. She grew up in Boer Park, attended Beis Yaakov High School, got married to David Fryer at 19, she has six children and now grandchildren. She was a legal secretary who decided to become a lawyer at the age of 30. She was able to navigate her own course and win against all odds. Fire also made history when she founded the first all-female volunteer ambulance corp in all of New York City as Rat Nashim, comprised of Hasidic women, this global Grassroots Women's Volunteer Agency was the subject of a documentary, 93 Queen, a must watch for every woman, every Orthodox woman, especially. The New York Times wrote about her. The Jewish grandmother was blazed a trail in her insular religious community with so much determination that the male authorities have simply had to make room. She has done so not by breaking the strict religious rule that govern ultra-Orthodox women's life, but by obeying them so strictly that there are limited grounds for objection. Mm -hmm. Fire re refused to reject any aspect of her faith to chart her own course. She wanted to prove that you didn't have to choose. You could have both. Welcome, Honorable Judge Fire, to our show. We are so happy. There is so much more to write about you, <laughs> but I had to make it short. This is the short version. This is the short version. Welcome, Judge Fryer, to our show. We're so happy and honored you took time out of your very busy schedule to join us here today. And before we start, I just want to give a shout out to your alma mater, to Brooklyn Law School. Shout out to Brooklyn Law. Amazing. And I need to ask you, are you wearing your, your um, college law ring? Because I, I sign an interview that you wear it every day. My Brooklyn Law School ring is probably on my right hand. I, I, I wear it every day because it always reminds me how Brooklyn Law School was a turning point in my life and how I was able to, with God's help, reach that level of graduating law school without compromising the values of my Hasidic community. So it's Amazing. Cool. Well, you inspired me, in Etsy. I looked for my UCLA ring and I found it and I took it out of you know, it's out of the drawer and I'm wearing it now. <laughs> so you inspired me to do that and many things. But anyway, I want to ask you, you have definitely chosen the road less traveled. Can you tell all of our listeners a little bit about your childhood? Um, were you always a determined child? Um, and did your parents push you to excel? Can you tell us a little bit about your background? Sure. My parents are wonderful parents. I come from a very humble background. My parents weren't wealthy. They weren't, they weren't, and they weren't politically connected. They weren't from any rabbinical dynasty. Humble home, amazing parents. My parents were very, very, um, they instilled in us the pride of being who we are and that we could accomplish whatever we want to accomplish. My mother had just one rule. She would tell us, girls, you can do whatever you want to, so long as it isn't illegal immoral or against the Torah. So while we were raised ultra-Orthodox slash Hasidic, I knew the world was wide open with opportunities. Of course, there were rules, but there were also opportunities. And um, I went to Beis Yaakov Elementary School, high school, seminary, and I was not going to be a rebel. I wanted to follow the strict traditions of my family and my community. I graduated high school at the age of 17, and I knew that I wasn't going to go to college because back then in the early 1980s, there were no college opportunities for the ultra-Orthodox Hasidic community. And I took a course in legal, and it, it, it was called legal stenography in high school. And I graduated high school at the age of 17 and got great jobs as a legal secretary. And I thought that was it. I was working in law firms. I worked my way up to be a paralegal. And it wasn't until I turned 30 when I started to feel this is not enough. 
it's not enough. And um, that's when I started to think about going to college and Toro College had opened up its doors. And my husband and my parents, my in-laws were very supportive. But my dream of law school, I kept it kind of quiet. I didn't know if I would get there. And I didn't know how receptive my family would be. But by the time I finished college, college took me six years. So I started when I was 30. If you figure out how old I am by the time I'm finished, it's perfectly fine. So college, <laughs> I, was, I, I started when I was 30. It took me six years to graduate. I started with three children. I graduated with six children. And then I applied for law school at the age of 36. Part-time law school was four years. So I was 40 when I graduated. Wow. And my uncle, um, his name was Dovi Schmidt, Allah HaShalom, of blessed memory, was a judge. I watched him as he married my mother's sister, how he went to law school, became a judge. And he was my mentor. And I always told him, I'd love to be a judge one day, just like you. Uh, and then when he retired, he told me, if I still want to be a judge, I have to run for his original seat. It was an election. It was a contested one. I did not have the political support of the community because the leaders felt that I wouldn't, I wouldn't win. And um, I told them, if God wants me to win, I'm going to win. So it was a tough battle. And it was a three-way race. And I won 41% of the vote. So it, was, it, it was just a clear, it was just a clear example of Siata Dishmaya. And when God wants something to happen, you just got to believe that he can make it happen. So, you so then have you have to be a lawyer 10 years to become a judge. And by the time I just hit my 10th year, I had the opportunity to run for public office. And um, I went to the party leaders for their support because it's a very political process to become a judge here in New York. And they said to me, Rachel, we really like you, but we were told that a Hasidic woman can never win in Borough Park. That's when I said, judge, if God wants me to win, I'm going to win. So my kids, my Hasidic children, turned Borough Park on its head. They had a campaign jingle made in Yiddish. I could play. <laughs> they made the, and they made they took my palm cards and I said, "Mommy, we're going to put it with all the." They made it. In, they translated my palm cards into Yiddish, and Ma, they said we're going to put it where all the shuls, every shul in Bar Park had my palm cards, and I will put it where everyone's where the men are going to read it. We're going to put it in the bathrooms. They did. They turned Bar Park upside down, and and I won. It was truly incredible. Yes. I want to, it's so funny because you answered my next question, which was, how did you, um, how did you, when did you decide to become a judge? But, you know, obviously coming from, you know, my kids grew up in an Orthodox school. Um, we are part of an Orthodox community. I wanted to ask you, because there are some sacrifices, like people think that it is, you know, I, you know, you said, oh, I won, but People don't realize really, not just the fight to win, but the inside fight, the fight with yourself even. Am I doing the right thing? Are my kids going to be judged because um, I'm doing this? Are people, you know, we, you know, in an Orthodox community, you have to marry your kids. Um, are, are people not going to let my daughters marry their son or my sons because they look at me as the rebel? So what sacrifices did you, do you so, feel that you had made? So you're, you're asking an excellent question and you'll be very surprised by the answer. The community of Borough Park voted for me with open arms. The community was very, very supportive. They, they, the men, the women, the children, Borough Park was very proud because they knew me by the time I ran. The issues that I really had and the struggle that I had was starting as Ras Nashim, oh. the EMT group. That's where I had opposition because that's where the people felt women don't belong here. When I myself personally wanted to become a lawyer, my first clients were the Hasidim and Kyrgyz Yol up in Monroe. Oh, wow. the, the community knows me. They know my husband. They know my children. So had I done this 20 years younger, that may have been different for me. Mm -hmm. they, they, they saw me raise my family. They saw my children grow up. They saw that I wasn't breaking the rules because the rules are very important to me. And I can tell you firsthand experience how all the rules of Sneos have protected me. 
I'm, I'm Shomeret Nigia, right? And I'm, even though there are many people who have hetero, they have the, the, the approval, it's okay socially to shake hands with between men and women, that's what people do. But I had to make my gedarim, my boundaries. And I had to be very clear and specific so that whenever anybody meets me, they know who I am. But the irony is, is that people would think intuitively that if you act that way, that it would hinder my, my career. But it was just the opposite. Because when you show someone that you have values and you stick to your values and you're respectful, but you stick to your values, they will not let you let go because the, the world wants people to look up to. So when you're going home early for Shabbos, you're, sick, you're only eating kosher food, but you're also respectful of your colleagues, they will trust you. They'll, they will, but what they're going to see is loyalty, commitment, dedication. So when they need to trust someone, they're going to trust you. So mm -hmm. all of these concepts and all these things that were protecting me along the way, I need to thank my teachers from Beis Yaakov because they had no idea that they were preparing me for a role that they could have never imagined. And you know something, you know what's so amazing? In New York, I'm not sure about other states, but in, the, in every courtroom where the judge sits, above the judge are the words, in God we trust. It's like, shivisi Hashem and Wherever I come in, I sit under the words of Hashem is watching me. You want to make me cry. It, I know, it's so emotional. <laughs> you know, I wanted to ask you, Your Honor, um, can you think of an example of a situation in which you emotionally and, intel and intellectually you wanted to rule a certain way, but given precedent, you knew you had to rule a different way? How did you handle that situation? And how often would you say that occurs? So that's a very tricky question because I, I, I need to tell you, I can't discuss politics. Um, and I can't discuss any particular cases. So I'll try to speak in general terms. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll talk about general terms. So first of all, generally speaking, if there, if there ever is a case where any judge feels that there's a conflict of interest, for any reason, the judge has to recuse herself. Mm -hmm. Now, if a, if a case comes in front of me and I'm related to one of the, the litigants, or it's a former employer or a former employee or, or a client, I must recuse myself. And it happens all the time. So if there ever is a case in front of me where I feel that I cannot be the judge without my own biases, then I would recuse myself. Mm -hmm. But Judaism is just the opposite. It gives you the framework. It, being religious gives me the framework and the foundation to be strong in my decision and apply the law. And you can have two different judges with the same set of facts in the same case will come up with a different decision. I mean, look at the United States Supreme Court. There's a majority and a minority decision. They don't all agree. So being confident and knowing that God really runs the world, I'm just I'm just a, you know, just a backseat driver here. But I always take the perspective of if Hashem put me here, if I'm, if I'm here, I'm supposed to be here. If this case is in front of me, I have to make a decision. And I have to look at the law and apply the law and make sure that a fair decision is, is what I produce. So it could be with any case. With any case, you have to research ask questions, let people talk, because sometimes when they talk, they will give you the answers that you need to hear. Do you give Shireem on the side? Because you sound like you'd be. <laughs> oh, well, when I speak, yeah, whenever I speak, it, it ends up being so filled with, you know, with, with, with Hashkafa, with, with the perspective of the, of, of the Torah, because I, I find, I find that this is what guides me every step of every step of my life. And I think that being religious and being Hasidic really made it easier for me, not harder. You know, I, I, when I was in private practice as a real estate attorney, I once had a, cl a client that had a property up in, uh, in 
in um, Sullivan County. And they had to travel to the Sullivan County tax collector in the government center. And he was Jewish, but not, not observant. And every time I came, he would ask me questions and he would have these philosophical conversations. And one day we, I was in his office and it got very noisy in the hallway. So he stands up and he wants to close the door. So I tell him, by the way, every time I say a story, I'm going to change the person's name. So I said to him, Joe, if you're going to close the door, it can't be locked from the outside when I'm alone with you in the room under Jewish law. And he looks at me and says to me, you know, Rachel, it is so easy working with you. There is this thick black line between us, and I know I will never cross that line. And when you think of how many people trip and fall in professional relationships and how it haunts them years later, whether it's people running for public office or people getting, getting you know, arrested or indicted years later, these rules really protect us. They don't hold us back from success. It just, we, we have to be strong and we have to be very clear and say, these are the rules I follow and I respect you. And I'm just asking you to respect my rules and it works. It really does. But then again, I wasn't in my twenties or in my thirties. I was already in my forties by the time I started my law practice. And I was so grateful for my background. I, I, I like more and more grateful every day. And then I see my children, Baruch Hashem, grow up and start their own families and be so supportive. My, my sons, my daughters, my sons-in-law, my daughters, everybody is so supportive of my project. So it's really a testament to really Moshe Emes Vissaraso Emes. The Torah is Emes. It guides you. It protects us. It gives us clarity. And when things go wrong, we all, we all suffer failure and setbacks because we're human beings. We know that. Mm -hmm. but you just get up again. You get up again and you just move on. I didn't pass every exam that I took. I didn't win everything. You know, in 30 minutes or in, you know, in one hour, I can talk and talk, but I'll, and I'll share the successes. But the failures were there. Of course they were there. And sometimes we need to fail because we have to understand how someone else feels when they fail. Wow. Mm -hmm. It's so funny it's because we're talking about the Torah. Um, my daughter, we were in my office in my house and we were discussing the laws and what question, we had so many questions for you. And she comes in and she goes, Ima, why are you discussing the law? Do you know that uh, the Talmud says that you have to follow the law of the land? Right. And I go, how do you know that? And she goes, but I learned that in second grade. And I go, we didn't even think about it. So you know what she goes? Yeah. You and Ken were not listening in class. <laughs> <laughs> sure, the, the, the pasuk is dina de dina. The law of the land is what applies. So mm -hmm. between, between dina de dina and between the, um, the idea of recusing yourself, the, on, the only time when there ever is a question is if there are two observant Jews in front of me. Then the question is, why aren't they in a base din? Why are they in secular court? That's the only time when off the record, I would say, why are you here? Hi. And, it's, and it's, it's, it's something that, that should be asked. And if they decide to continue with secular court, we continue. Wow. Wow. Judge Fyatt, can you tell me how you decided to found um, Ezrat Nashim? The, all, the first all-female volunteer ambulance corp in all of New York City. Is it in just New York, all of New York City, is, or is it the first ever in the United States? The first all-women that I, in the world, maybe. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah Show they, me another one. There um, isn't in Los Angeles. There, there's, there it doesn't exist in LA. No. So, no. And I know that there was a lot of controversy in the community because I watched the film which almost split the community in two. It was really, right. um, why was it so important for you to start as Rat Nashim? How did your family handle all the pressure? And can you also let us know how the documentary 93 Queen came about? Okay, so first I'll just tell you 93 Queen, how they came about, and then I'll tell you why I got involved as Rat Nashim. So 93 Queen came about when we started to get some publicity and some traction on social media, Paula Eisel contacted me by email, introduced herself as a modern orthodox filmmaker 
a documentary filmmaker, and that she wants her to do a positive film about Hasidim. She heard about her story and she thinks it would make a great subject for a documentary. And I said, I'm not interested. Oh, but please, Ruchi, she said, it'll be so good, it'll break the stereotype. There's, there's such negativity out in the media about Hasidim that it'll break the stereotype about Hasidic women and you'll shatter all these, you know, all these misconceptions. I said to her, I used to call her Penina. I used her Hebrew name. I said, Penina, I said, it's a great idea, but the risk to my family is so great. I, I just can't do it. It's just not fair to my family. But Ruchi, she said, it'll make such a Kiddush Hashem. Kiddush Hashem, that's my soft spot. If the film will make a Kiddush Hashem, let me go to my rabbi. Let me ask him and see what he says. We went to the rabbi and he said, it's no question about halacha. If you want to do a film that's going to make a Kiddush Hashem, it should be with bracha and hatzlacha. So that's how the film came out. And all along the way, I had no idea what the finished product was going to be. It would happen in real time. As, as the scenes were unfolding, they were actually happening. I, I didn't write a script. I had no idea when we started if Ezra Sanchez would even be successful. I had no idea I was going to run for public office during this time. I had no idea. But I did it with Emuna Hashem. I'm doing this L'Shem Shemayim. Let's hope it's going to be a good film. And even when, when it was done, I didn't know if it was good because I was judging it from the from this from the you know focus from the standpoint of the Hasidim. And people think that we're hanging out our dirty laundry. But what Panina explained to me and taught me is she made it for the outside world. It wasn't made for people who live in Borough Park to explain to the outsiders mm -hmm. what our community is all about and to see that women are strong. Women, and we're, we're not all the same. We have different opinions and that's fine. Yeah. So that's how docu the documentary film came to be. I had no idea what it would be like. I didn't make money on it. I don't control it. I would, I would, I was told when I would start that I would be able to um, approve it, but that I, uh, my opinion was taken into account. But I didn't control the outcome of the film. So if you all liked it, I'm so happy that I, oh, I know that we succeeded in what we wanted to accomplish. Yeah, it was fabulous. I sent it to my daughter, and she's like, she's in residency right now, and she's like, I'm like, Lizzie, you have to watch it. She goes, Imam, after a call, she was 24 hours. I won't be able to. I said, please. She called me. Three hours later, she said, Ima, I got something to eat. And I decided to watch it because she she was so inspired by it <laughs> because she's younger. And she, a lot of the things that you went through, she really, she said, Ima, I'm saving lives, but I'm being judged for going to medical school. But I, And it's really funny because the same people that gave her a hard time then gave her her the bracha right. after they saw what she's doing right. so she said it made me so happy the, it, it, she, i was so happy she liked it <laughs> yeah oh so much. incredible um judge fire i wanted to ask you have you ever observed tension in jewish law and the law that judges are asked to apply in their cases and i wanted to know if you could give us an example i know you can't talk about a case in particular or politics as you said but if you could share that you, with us. You, do you want to skip over the other question? Because it was, a re I want to share with you why I started as West Nashim. Oh, okay. I, yes. I didn't tell you yes. why I started. So I want to just rewind um, and explain to you what happened at the turning point in my life when I started law school. So all along my journey, I had naysayers every step of the way. It's never going to happen. It's never going to happen. You'll never get through college. You'll never get to law. You'll never get accepted to law school. If you do, you'll never finish. You'll never pass the bar. And even if you do, who's going to come? You'll never have clients. Naysayers, naysayers every step of the way. And the biggest, the biggest naysayers would say, you won't stay as religious if you go through school. And to me, what was very, very important was to remain exactly the same. I wanted to be committed to my community standards and be a good mother, a good wife. I did not want to compromise any of my standards of the Hasidic community. So when I got to law school, I said, now is going to be a real test. Because when I went to Toro College, it was really like an extension of high school and seminary. It was a Jewish institution. The professors were all Jewish. We didn't have classes on Shabbos. We didn't have assignments over the weekend or the Chagim. So it really wasn't challenging. 
uh, going into law school now, a complete liberal academic environment, is when I felt a little nervous. So I made my deal with God. And I said, dear God, please help me get through law school without compromising my standards. And when your children come to me for help, I will help them. Well, God wasted no time in testing me. Shortly after I graduated law school, I got involved with helping kids at risk, primarily boys in the Hasidic community. I started an organization called Bederach. I helped the yeshiva get started in Williamsburg, Brooklyn to help these boys. Once I developed a name for myself that I stand up and I speak up for people who don't have a voice, I got a phone call one random night in the summer and the woman said to me, she's an EMT and a doula, a labor coach, and they're having a meeting that night because this group of women would like to join Hatzalah, which is a wonderful organization. It's an EMS agency in the Jewish communities that save thousands of lives every year. They are only men. They don't accept women. Now, these women wanted to serve as EMTs for emergency labor exclusively that if a woman goes into labor and has to deliver her baby at home, she should have the ability to have women EMTs come and deliver the baby and not compromise her dignity and create trauma by giving birth at the hands of your neighbors. Because Hatala is so phenomenal, I have so many volunteers, their, their response time is so quick because there's always someone that lives near you who is an EMT. And I listened to their story and they told me that for 30 years before that, they were trying. And that when Hatzalah was first founded, there was supposed to be a women's division. And that these women, some of them who were already in their 70s, were trained as EMTs 30 years earlier and trained 300 women to form what should have been then a women's division. I heard the story, it blew my mind. Why didn't I know about this? I grew up in Borough Park. It was brushed under the carpet. And I said to them, look here, I'm a lawyer. I need my evidence. I want to speak to women and find out, is it necessary? I interviewed women who had stories of giving birth. A minion, 10 men were in my bathroom. Oh, yeah. I would hear these oh. stories. So I realized I have to do this. I was not prepared for the opposition for the threats, which you saw in 93 Queen. They called me on social media, a radical feminist, which got all the TV outlets and they, all the media was after me. They all wanted to interview the radical Hasidic feminist. And I explained to them, I'm not a feminist, I said. I, I really believe that the Torah puts women on a pedestal and feminism is a secular concept. But talk to me about women's abilities, our capabilities, our role in Judaism, we're amazing. We're wonderful. Feminism is a secular concept. Yes, we should have equal pay for the equal job. Absolutely. But in terms of who we are as women, Ezra Snashim is about who we are as women. And, I, and they said, oh, it's all about Rachel Fryer with her women's rights. And I said, no, this is not about women's rights. It happens to be that women are usually right especially when it comes to our medical care. <laughs> but this is about the dignity of women. And we should have this choice when it comes to medical care. And the more they threatened me to stop and back down, the stronger I became. And that's really where the sacrifice came in. That's really where my husband really sacrificed. Because until people realized that I'm not going to back down. And I had Rabbanim who supported me, but behind the scenes. Because it was so politically charged, the Rabbanim couldn't deal with the pressure. And I felt bad for them. Why should they have to deal with the pressure? Even what you saw in 93 Queen, see 93 Queen showed snippets of things, but it couldn't, didn't show everything. For example, we take in single girls. By the time the film ended, we realized that the reason that we didn't take in single girls was because we just copied Hatzalah's framework. But Hatzalah is a group of men and they don't want to have single boys treating women. But we're women treating women. It doesn't right. matter if you're married or not. And once right. we realized that, we changed our policy. But the film didn't change because right. it, it gets more views. I was going to ask you because that really bothered. I have to tell you, watching the film, that's the only thing that bothered me. 
And by the time the film was was released, it changed it. And I told her, change, no, they left it. You know what was my favorite part of the film? Which when one? all the women were there, you delivered the first baby and you had everybody, I guess, at your house and your husband walks by and he goes, you have a really strong woman here. Yeah. And I felt, you know what? Because it's a lot of pressure on him too. And and I I it, it I started crying. I'm like, I passed it because my husband went to get his coffee and he was watching the film with me. I'm like, you have to come and see this. Look how cute this is. <laughs> you know, you know, and that was a favorite part. <laughs> amazing. And you should know that people make a big deal about me. But really, my husband, he's the trailblazer. So many men would tell him, how could you let your wife do this? I would never let. And, and he's so proud. When I was running for public office, he ran to so many rabbis to get their endorsement. He ran around getting signatures from me. And, and, and he's, he's very religious. He is so religious and he, and he learns Torah most of the day. So he's so devoutly religious and so observant but he supports me in all of my goals. So Beautiful. he gets a lot of credit. Well, you're great role models for your children yes. and grandchildren. Yes, thank And for you. The, thank all you. the future generation of yeah. Orthodox yeah. women. All of, yeah, all of cholesterol. Yeah. So Karen, you want to ask your question? Yeah, so I, <laughs> I wanted to ask you, um, thank you for sharing all of that with us. Um, have you so have you ever experienced tension in Jewish law and the law that judges are asked to apply in their cases? And if possible, can you give us an example? So actually, I really haven't. The type of cases that I that I that I get in civil court are breach of contract cases, um, motor vehicle accident cases, uh, the type of cases where there is no hashkafic principle that that contradicts. It, the hashkafa that we have of tzedek tzedek tirdof, of always seeking justice and truth, I have not found any conflict. Mm. Okay. Um, I have to ask you, how did you establish guardrails so that your fellow judges or others um, know that you will not be working on Shabbat without them getting bitter that you have to, you can't stay late on Fridays? And also, did you experience any anti-Semitism okay. in your career as a whole? Okay, so there were there are many Sabbath observant judges in Brooklyn. So the concept of leaving early on Friday for Shabbos is not new to the court system. What's new to the court system are like these extra restrictions. I don't shake hands with men. And I, 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 you know, my hair is covered with a wig and my dresses are long. So it's the, the rules that I follow, which are more stringent, but the concept of Shabbat, Yamam Tovim, that the court system has already accepted. And it's a wonderful system because I have unlimited religious days off. So the court system is very generous and very respectful of Shabbos and Yamam Tovim. So that was not a problem either. And in terms of my colleagues, Yes, when I leave early, we have I have to get someone to cover for me. And the same thing when someone else leaves, takes vacation, we, we cover for each other. But I try very hard to be respectful, thankful. I'll bring in a challah to thank them. I'll bring in something. I'll say, no, you let me, you're I'm, you're allowing me to go home and observe my Shabbos. I want to share my Shabbos with you. Oh, that's so I'll beautiful. try to bring in some challah. Try to just like be grateful for the people that are accommodating me. Wow. So it's beautiful. Yeah. And did you experience anti anti Semitism? So, you know, I think that there are people out there in the world that are just very nice and people that are just not nice. So, I don't know if I experienced difficulty because people were just difficult. I don't know if I could say it was anti Semitism because I, the challenges that I've had in my career have more of my challenges have come from the people who are actually ultra religious and not secular. The oh. secular people have given really given me a lot of respect. It was the religious people who felt like I was doing something they felt was wrong. So they gave me a hard time. And I would tell them, I am following the same Torah that you are following. You know, we pray to the same God three times a day. Don't tell me what I'm doing is wrong. 
And that's what they didn't like because I stood up to them. I said, this is not right. If women should have the right to have another woman take care of them. So that's where the challenge really came from. When I ran for civil court judge, the neighborhood, the community was very proud. They wow. voted for me. They, they came for me. It was, it was, I couldn't have won without people from Borough Park voting for me. Wow. They voted. I want to ask you before we wrap up, it just came up. It's not part of the question. It's so funny because Karen always said, Etty, you have to keep to script. Because, yeah. <laughs> you know, us Israelis, you know, we can never keep to. <laughs> yeah. Well, I have something to say, too, before the closing. <laughs> <laughs> I want to ask you, who is your role model? Somebody that in your life that you always, always looked up to and felt this is, because for me, it's my father. I always wanted to be like my father. I have to tell you, he's 80 years old. He was he was just 80. And we made a big celebration. I was at his house and I go, Abba, am I finally like you? Because we're very close. Do you feel that I have a lot of what you have? Your personality is very smart. And he goes, absolutely. And I was so happy. I'm like, like my Abba in his 80. And he's like, Eddie. It's not because you you reached where I am. It's just at my age, I'm going downwards. At your <laughs> age, you're still going up. We met somewhere in the middle. <laughs> That's so funny. Dutch Fryer, are you going to say it's your mother? So my mother actually is the one who I am so indebted to for helping me, for guiding me every step of the way. She's she's my right hand, my right hand, my left hand and everything in between. She's the one who encouraged me to go to law school. She's the one who encouraged me. She became an EMT together with me. We took the EMT class together. Wow. That was the second time we took a class together. The first class we took together was Lamaze. My my youngest brother and my oldest son are six weeks apart. Oh, so we, wow. took a, we took Lamaze together. So my mother is definitely my inspiration. She's my guiding light and she helps me every step of the way. She is what keeps me grounded. Now, the other part of your question is, who is a role model for me? Because people ask me all the time, is it Ruth Bader Ginsburg? Was it Golda Meir? And I say, no. My, my role model is a woman by the name of Sarah Shanira who lived in Krakow, Poland, between the two world wars. And she was one who founded the Beit Yaakov movement. Prior to her time, Jewish girls did not go to school, right? Everybody went to public school, and the boys came home, and they sat, and they learned with the Rebbe's. But the girls didn't learn Torah or Judaism. Whatever the mothers taught them, they knew. Sarah Shneira saw that girls need to be motivated in Judaism, and we need to have schools for Jewish girls. Now, when I went to Beis Yaakov, many of Sarah Shanira's students were my teachers many years ago. And we learned about Sarah Shanira. We sang songs about her, the mother of Beis Yaakov. She was a seamstress. She would sew clothes and she would see how the girls that came in were just interested in all the different secular concepts, socialism, communism that was sweeping through Europe. They weren't interested in Torah and Yiddishkeit. But even though she knew that it was the right thing to do, she had opposition. But when I was in school, we didn't learn about the opposition. Only when I was an adult and I read a book about her life, it was called Carry Me In Your Heart by one of her students. When I read that book, I read it when I was in LA once for a Shabbos and it wasn't where, where the person who was hosting me had it on the bookshelf. I said, this is what I needed to read. I needed to read of a woman who was so devout she created the Beshako movement and she had opposition. People would throw stones at her students going, to, going in the street and she never gave up. And from her, I learned that it doesn't matter if you have opposition, if you know you're doing the right thing, just keep on doing it. So my mother in the present and Sarah Schneer in the past. And my mother's name is Sarah. So oh, that is beautiful. beautiful. Yes, from Thank Sarah to Sarah. Wow. So now we wouldn't be called Yentas if we, before I close out, <laughs> we need to just, before I close out, we need to ask you what's on your Shabbat menu for tomorrow? <laughs> the, same, the same standard. I, I have a rule, really. If it's more than 20 minutes to, to make, I don't make it. I make simple things, but my kids love it. 
So you know, they, love, they love my chicken soup, but I also freeze in advance. So oh. the potato kugel and the apple kugel and the, the, the salmon and the gefilte fish and, and the standard. But you know, you know what's going on in my head right now? What? You have six kids and I can hear them saying, Ma, can you make schnitzel? No, Ma, can you make a filter fish? And you're saying, overruled, overruled. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nina. <laughs> You know, one of the things I'll tell you, though, people always ask me what it was like when my kids were younger and I was going to law school and doing all this. And my kids were always involved. Every kid had a chance to come to a law school class with me, to a college class with me. So when I said mommy's going to school, they had an idea where I was going. When I would work in the offices, they, they came to the office with me. When I studied for the bar, they colored my 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 index cards to study. I was studying for my study cards. That is they so beautiful. Yeah. So so that's how you can do it. Any any woman out there, you could pursue your dreams. Whatever connects you to God, to Yiddish guy, don't think you have to compromise your values to be successful. Because Thank my God. journey was just the opposite. It's beautiful. just the opposite. I think you also know, kids. I appreciate because you know I was when my daughter the oldest one was growing up um I was the only I was one of the few mothers that had, had her own career and I felt guilty my parents would help me watch her you know I had a housekeeper and as she got older and with the younger one it was you know financially I was able to stay more with them and I asked her, Lizzie, and my other kids, did it ever bother you that all your friends' moms were a stay-at-home mom? And Lizzie said, no, actually, I think it made us who we are today, the workaholics that we are, the, the way that we are dedicated to our own families. Uh, it, it showed us that you can have it all. You could have it all, you know? Absolutely. And you inspired them. Um, Absolutely. You know, when, when my three sons must have been around like six, eight, and 10, my oldest son came home from yeshiva one day, very upset. I said to him, Mashallah, you look very upset. What happened? He said the boys in, in Haida came to him in yeshiva with a little bar park phone book. And I'll say what they said in Yiddish and I'll translate it. They took the bar park phone book and they said, There's not one woman lawyer in bar park. What's your mom doing? I said, oh, Mashallah, that's very serious. What did you say? He said, I told them, says, Nisht man mama, it's not my mother. It's a different friar. <laughs> okay, Mashallah, that's, that's the way you deal with it. I went to my second son. My second son, Shlaimi, is today the same way he was years ago. Very, very from, very devout, very sincere. He still takes his glasses off when he walks in the streets in Bar Park. He shouldn't see anything inappropriate. He still stands up for me whenever I walk into the room. A precious young man. I asked him back then, little Shlaimi, what do you do when the boys tease you in, in, in yeshiva? He says, Mommy, ich mach mich nicht sitin. I don't even pay attention. I'm so busy learning Torah and davening. I don't bother. Oh. I mean, that's, a, that's a also another approach. I went to my third son, Mailach. Mailach was this cute kid, big blue eyes, blonde, curly hair. He still, he still dropped that good looking. I said to him, Mailach, what do you do when the boys tease you? He says, me? I'm very proud. I say I have a small mother that does big things. Oh, wow. And but you know, by the time I ran for public office, all my kids were so proud. They they couldn't stop, they just couldn't stop, you know, sharing their pride in what we was we did this together. It, it was a family project. It really was. It really was, Judge Fryer. Judge Fryer, what an honor it was to have you here with us on Yentas in the City. You're such a role model for so many women, especially Orthodox women. You have really shown our younger generation how strong women really are. And with dedication and hard work, what we can that we can have it all. Just like Golda Meir said, quote, ability hits the mark where presumption overshoots and dividends fall short. You have hit the mark on so many levels and your journey has truly inspired Etsy and I. The documentary 93 Queen brought us to tears. We're in awe of how much you have accomplished all the while keeping true to your faith and principles. We can't wait to come to New York and take you to dinner. We really look forward to that. We wanna thank you so much again. 
We also want to thank all of our followers for listening to this episode. Please remember, you can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at Yentas in the City. You can also write to us at dearyentas at gmail.com. We would love to hear from you and answer your letters on our weekly advice column. We also want to thank our sponsors, Soft Smart, Sin- Soft Smart Systems International Inc. and Conquest Realty Investments. We really hope you enjoyed this episode. We have a lot more coming. This is Karen Cohen and Etty Elkis, and we are Yentas in the City. I will end this episode with a very famous quote, he who cares for days sows wheat, he who cares for years plants trees, he who cares for generations educates people. Remember to be safe and do the right thing and be the Ruth in the room. Stay safe, everyone. Thank you for being here. And thank you, Judge Fryer. You're very welcome. And thank you for having me. 